It's time now for Word Alive from the Upper Room in Gatesville, North Carolina, with Pastor Eric Earhart. Join us in seeing lives changed by the power of God's Word. You're invited to join us in person on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. at 807 Main Street in Gatesville, North Carolina. You can also listen to our live audio podcast at www.ustream.com. And now, today's message. Turn to someone close to you and say, uh, I'm glad to be here. Amen. Amen. Now, now give them a hand for being here. Amen. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. March gladness. Uh, Sister Carol Land, uh, uh, let us know that um, we're not worried about March madness because we're going to walk into this and get some March gladness. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but... Um, there's times when I realize that um, adversity is pressing in. I realize that there's uh, things going on in my life that um, I can't seem to do anything about. I can't make them go away. I can't change them. I can't beat them back. I can't pray them away. I can't fast them into oblivion. There's just times uh, and seasons in our lives uh, when things seem to be tough and you can't make it stop. But I'm here to tell you today that we're going to explore uh, this month how God brings us gladness in the midst of it. I, I love in Proverbs 3, 25, 26, it says here, uh, Have no fear of sudden disaster. Somebody say no fear. Do you believe that? Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked. For the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. I think somebody ought to give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. Amen. I, I, as we go through this uh, month of gladness, as we, because the world, man, the world is full of madness. Come on, somebody. Um, there's a reason they call it March Madness, and I know they're talking about basketball and that stuff, but the reality is, is the world is full of madness. And if you remember being in the world, uh, um, as Brother Arthur was just uh, reminding us, uh, you remember sometimes being full of that madness uh, and having the, uh, just some stuff going on that you look back on now and uh, we sang, when I think about the Lord, huh, how he saved me, how he changed me, how he, how he uh, filled me with the Holy Ghost, uh, um, put my feet on a solid ground, all these things. And as I was sitting there singing that, I was thinking, wow, Lord, that song is not just words. That's the reality of a life change by the power, by the power of God's grace, by His Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus Christ. That song was for real for me. And, and listening to Brother Arthur again share some of his testimony uh, reminded me um, that the world is full of madness, and I used to walk in that world, but, but now we can be full of some March gladness. Amen? Amen. So I, I want to try this one more time here. It says, have no fear of sudden disaster. Somebody say, no fear. Come on, say it again. No fear. You've got to grab a hold of that. This is for you. This is for you. You're going to walk out of here and not have any fear. Somebody today is going to get this. Somebody's going to walk out of here with a word today that's for them, and they say, that, that's it. Somebody watching today is going to say, this word's for me. I am going to reject fear. I'm going to be broken of fear. I am going to stop uh, discussing with it. I'm going to stop uh, uh, negotiating with it. I'm going to stop uh, inviting it in. I'm going to stop having it sit on my couch and talk with me. I'm going to have no fear. Amen? I, there's, a, there's bumper stickers or something, stickers on the back of people's car windows that say no fear. And I look at those things, and I think sometimes as I'm riding behind these people, I think if they don't have Jesus, they don't even know what that means. See, what they think that means is that they can get out and be tough and punch someone in the face or, or be violent or, or rugged or tough or whatever they, they think that is. No fear! Arr! Um, but the reality is, is every time a bill comes in and every month or every time something happens fear overtakes their hearts and minds and they begin to come on somebody see fear isn't always about confronting someone in a parking lot I used to do that really well too well I, I would go uh, to jail for that often uh, for being very confrontational and at the time I thought that I had no fear but, but do you realize that when I got saved I was afraid of simply holding a job I was afraid of simply paying my bills every month. I was afraid of being responsible. Come on, somebody. 
I said I had no fear because I could shoot you or beat you up. But the reality is I had a core of fear that kept me from being able to do the basic things in life. I love this here, and there's a reason we can have gladness. He said, have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be at your side. Come on, somebody. The Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. Glory to God. Now that leads me into what we're going to, to dissect for this month of gladness. And it's the upside of adversity. The upside of adversity. I know most people would think that um, um, that's crazy. The upside of adversity? Yeah, the upside of adversity. Um, I think there's a lot of preaching that, that tends to lead people to believe or tends to make people think um, that if you come to Jesus, if you get saved, if you go to church, if you join the church, if you get baptized, if you say a prayer, if you do something, that all of a sudden life's supposed to get peaches and cream. I think that lie kind of permeates, and I don't think it comes from the pulpits uh, uh, so much as it comes from the enemy of our soul. Come on, somebody. The reality of following Jesus is, is he talks about crazy stuff about deny yourself die to yourself. He said, I was homeless and if you're going to follow me, you might be the same way. He's saying that your enemies are going to be those in your family. He's going to say that you're going to suffer for my name's sake, that you'll be hated by everyone for my name's sake. And I'm thinking, hold on. What Jesus says has nothing to do with what we seem to interpret sometimes as being a Christian. Somehow the interpretation comes across because Jesus heals that people ain't never going to have sickness. Oh, well, you can just live without ever having sickness. Well, I've got to tell you, every single person in this world, every single human being that's ever broke the water and come through the womb and entered this world, every human being that's ever took a breath uh, and lived a life has faced adversity, has faced suffering, has, has struggled with something and struggles right now with something. You, it, has anybody ever... I mean, come on. Have you ever thought about the fact that the guy that's praying for you to be healed might be wearing glasses like Coke bottles? Come on, somebody. Don't, don't be fooled. Everybody is dealing with the effects of this broken world and broken sin. But what we have is a promise of God that He can take adversity and do something good with it. That He can take suffering and make it work to our good. That He can take uh, a persecution and bring forth salvation. God is able to make all things work to the good for those who love Him. So there is an upside to adversity. See, the whole world struggles with, with uh, um, suffering. And too often, we like to make our suffering the big deal in our life. All right? So we, we, anytime we, we go somewhere, it's what we want to talk about. Uh, we get on Facebook and we want to blab about it. It's always about what I'm going through and what I'm dealing with. Come on, somebody. But the Word of God tells me in 1 Peter chapter 5 that the whole world and all your brothers are going through the same exact thing you are. Now, we like to think our suffering special. We like to think our adversity, well, you know, you see, I, I, was, I was wrestling some big demons because I'm the pastor. No, it was probably like a little dude like that. And he's probably like this powerless little weak little wimpy little demon and they're like, you know, the pastor's always all about his own stuff and he's always about his own problems so we don't even need to send like Max over there. Let's send Bob. And little Bob demon comes over there and I wrestle all night with him because uh, I like to lay in, I don't know about you guys on Saturday nights but I lay a bed at night on Saturday nights and I know I've got to get up in the morning and, and, I, and, I've, and I've got to come and, and, and be refreshed and be ready to minister but I'll seemingly lay there and I'll try to answer all the questions for all the problems of the world. And when 3.30 comes, I'm thinking, you ought to really go to sleep because the kids are going to be getting up here in about three hours, three and a half hours. And, and, and then, you know, then about 4 o'clock, it's like, all right, Lord, I've got to go into prayer now because I'm battling. And what I did was I sat there and thought about your problems, my problems, and, and I meditated on the wrong thing. And it didn't take no big giant demon to come to a side sidetrack me. Little Bob could be just standing over there just whispering stupid stuff. And I'm, I'm broke down and beat down. Because I thought my adversity was so special. I need you to understand that everybody, 
everybody experiences suffering in this life. There's no amount of millions. I, you know, that whole, this whole uh, uh, a class division. America's always been special because that wasn't uh, a part of our lexicon. It's not, we're not like England. We're not like France. We're not like uh, um, tribal societies where we have chiefs and these other things. Anybody in America can get elected to anything. We've always been a classless society. We've always been a society when anybody can, can rise to whatever occasion that their skills, their giftings, and their, their perseverance would bring forth. Whatever God put in them, you had opportunity to let it come out of you. In other societies, it's not so. It's by your last name. It's by your, your royalty, your blood, whether your family was a chief or whether your fam family was a, a banker. Uh, but there's been some crazy folks elected to some crazy high offices in America. Come on, somebody. We, we, if you ever go through a list of our congressmen and women and you look at their, their lives and what they've achieved or not achieved, you would think to yourself, how in the world did they get elected to that position? We're America. Okay. Um, there's no amount of political positioning. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of, of um, uh, poverty or bad neighborhoods. That uh, Nothing allows you to escape the adversity and the sufferings that life brings. You can't. It, millionaires commit suicide. Millionaires commit suicide. And you would think to yourself, well, uh, I had their money. I wouldn't. I just, yeah, uh-huh. Right. You need to understand that your sufferings are no different than anybody else's sufferings. We're all suffering. So the issue is, is, is how do I handle that? How do I decipher that? I, it, how I understand my suffering, how I uh, view this uh, uh, reality of life here on earth as a human being, uh, our understanding will change our response. Our understanding of suffering will change our response. See, if you're always thinking that it's greener on the other side, if you're always thinking that, well, they don't deal with what I deal with, or if you're always thinking that your adversity or your suffering is special, you're going to have a hard time overcoming it. When you change the way you view suffering in life, and you change the way you view adversity in life, it's going to change your response. And I can tell you right now, your response will be a big part of determining your destiny. Your response to the sufferings of life, not the good times, not the blessings, your response to the adversities of life will determine to a large degree your destiny in life. You see, God's already gifted you. God's already placed things in your life. God's already given you hard wirings that are different than anybody else. You know, I was thinking the other day, and uh, this might uh, shock some people, and if it does, that's okay. Well, we can all chew on it a little bit. But I was thinking the other day, I know a family who has, a, um, has had one child with Down syndrome. They've now adopted another child from overseas with Down syndrome. And they're in the process of adopting another one right now from the same orphanage uh, uh, in Bulgaria with Down syndrome. And there's something amazing about a child with Down syndrome, a person with Down syndrome. They seem to always have a smile on their face. They seem to be totally oblivious to all the cares of the world. Their, their mind is not locked on what was just said on Facebook. They're not caught in the, the, the CNN news cycle. They're not worried about what the latest uh, fashion trend was. When, when any, any time if you've ever had an opportunity to engage someone who's dealing with Down syndrome, you find that they seem to just be happy. They just seem to be joyful. And you're thinking, what in the world is going on? And what you find out is, is rarely are they ever focused on themselves or their own problems. They're always just amazed by the little things in life. And those little things bring them so much joy. Wow. What we could learn from human beings with Down syndrome. What we could learn. So, number one, I want you to, to, to think about what we're going to engage in for the month of March, for March Gladness. Number one, that everybody experiences suffering. You've you got you to gotta stop battling in your mind with the, the, the class warfare or the, 
the, the, the uh, racial uh, divide or the denominational divide of always thinking those people or them people or they. And you've got to think of we, us. Come on, somebody, I ought to say amen to that. You've got to think in terms of, whoa, we all suffer. Everybody's going something. I don't care what his position is or what her place is. We're all going through something. We're all going through something. And we all need the Lord's grace. We all need the Lord's mercy. We all need the Lord's power. We need the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Number two, that the way I look at my suffering, the way I, I see it, is going to completely and totally uh, uh, change my response. And that my response to suffering, my response to adversity, is going to have a huge determining factor on my destiny with the Lord. Amen? Amen. I, I want to look at something here that I think uh, um, that's going to set the stage for the rest of this month and, and set the stage for this series here. And, and it's a question. Blessed or cursed? Blessed or cursed? Do you see yourself as blessed or cursed? Now, one of the things that I struggle with all my life is um, um, this, this um, dogged spirit that made me think I had a black cloud over me. And I know uh, lots of people who think like that. Lots of people, oh, I got a black cloud. If it wasn't for, for bad news, I'd have no news at all. If it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Blah, blah, blah. I, I Listen, I get it. Been there, done that, experienced it. Uh, um, I probably have a closet full of the T-shirts of the black cloud syndrome. And, and you walk around in life feeling like that you're cursed and not blessed. And I remember when I got saved, the Lord just changed my name to blessed. He said, you will always answer people like this. And he, and he did it in the midst of a tough situation, a very difficult situation. And, and he said, this is going to be your response to life and people always. And I don't care what's going on with you. I don't care how much you're suffering and how much adversity you're facing. You will declare you're blessed. Now, for the last uh, almost 16 years... I have stuck to that. I have stuck to that. But there's been a many a time I don't feel blessed. There's been a many a time I don't think I'm blessed. But because of the obedient condition response to the Lord, that I am blessed, I'm always going to be reminded by the Holy Spirit that that is true despite my circumstances. I remember one time at, a, um, at another church, I walked in, and I like to, on Sunday mornings, I like to wander around and shake hands and hug and say hi to people. It's just that, that whole deal I like to do. It's a personality issue, and I know some people don't have that personality, and they want to go hide in the corner and hope no one comes and says hi to them. You know, I, listen, I understand. But I want to just hug and shake and, you know, and hey, and, and, and I'm wandering around that morning and shaking everybody's hand. Hey, how you doing? And all of a sudden, I go and shake this uh, uh, dear sister's hand, and, you know, she was... Uh, um, an older woman, and, and uh, uh, she said, Pastor Eric, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm blessed. And uh, at that time, my father was dying of cancer. And I was driving every single day to the uh, VA hospital in Hampton to go see him. Every day, after work, after church, every day. Driving there to watch uh, my hero waste away. And, um, and uh, so she says, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm blessed. And uh, she yelled at me right there in the sanctuary and says, um, What's your problem? Why are you always happy? You can't always be happy. I said, I said, dear, I'm not always happy. I said, in fact, right now, I'm an extremely sad man. I said, but I'm blessed. I am blessed. And my circumstances will not change the fact that because the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all sin, my circumstances will not change the fact that because He lives, I can face tomorrow. My circumstances will not change the fact that He's the King of kings and Lord of lords and He has conquered the grave. My circumstances will not change the fact that I am blessed. And sometimes you just got to be able to declare it despite how you feel. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. So th this, this, this leads me to the question, how, how do I see myself? If, if, if the, the way I understand um, uh, adversity is going to condition my response, and if my response 
is going to set my destiny. Do I see myself as cursed or blessed? Hmm. And, and so I, I thought about this passage here in uh, um, uh, Numbers 23. It's a classic one. Uh, you guys may be well familiar with it, but I'll set the stage just in case you're not. Um, we have the children of Israel have uh, now moved out of the desert. They moved into the, the promised land. Joshua's leading these guys, and, and uh, they're winning battle after battle after battle, and, and uh, just, uh, uh, man, they're whooping them up. They just, God has given them favor and grace. God's power is going to perform. The Spirit of the Lord is uh, uh, performing miracles. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're blowing trumpets and shouting, and walls are coming down. Come on. They, they're just winning. And uh, so King uh, 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 Balak sees this happening. He can see across the valley and he sees this army coming of Israelites and he sees that God is with them and, and he's scared to death because he's about to lose his kingdom. So he calls for the prophet Balaam and says, um, listen, I need you to curse these folks, man. I know you, you've got a connection with God. And I need you to curse these folks because I'm going to lose my kingdom if something don't happen here. And... Um, the, the, the response of the prophet Balaam is a classic one that I, I pray brings you some uh, hope today and allows you to walk out of here saying, I have no fear because the Lord will be beside me. Amen? Let's take a look. At this. We're going to pick it up in uh, Numbers 23, um, uh, verse 8. And this is uh, Balaam's response. How can I curse those whom God has not cursed? Somebody say Amen. How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? From the rocky peaks I see them. From the heights I view them. I see a people who live apart. And do not consider themselves one of the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number even a fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and may my final end be like theirs. Wow. Wow. These people were slaves, had been led by Moses out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt. They wander across the desert. Everybody, they get to a point where they just, just, they're not going to obey God. They're rebelling against the leadership. They're rebelling against the vision. They're rebelling against God's promise in their life and, and God's uh, uh, leadership. And, and God says, okay, everybody 20 years old and above, you're, you're, you're just going to be wiped out and all the next generation, I'll take them in. He takes these guys into the promised land. And, and they are having victory after victory. They're whipping nations three and four times their size. Armies, uh, unbelievable. The Holy Spirit's given like all kinds of supernatural insight and, and how to do the battle and when to do the battle. And, and, and they get to this place and, and uh, this, this king calls his prophet. They get on this mountain and they're looking down and, and he makes these great statements here. And I thought, I started thinking, I said, God, what, what, what is it that you're saying to me in this? Because I know that um, uh, for my personal uh, life, uh, let, let, me, let me just segue into this for a minute, and uh, hopefully this is going to speak to some of you in a way that uh, becomes meaningful. In my personal life, over the last uh, um, several years, I have, um, I hit what I consider like a wall uh, uh, of adversity. And I really thought that, well, then I need to pray. And I need to rebuke some demons. And I need to study more. And I need to do this more and that more. And I need to... Uh, and, and, and I really began to just try to, over the last three years, um, try to dig my way out of this adversity that I had found myself in. And uh, last October, during a 21-day fast, the Lord begins to minister to me. And He says, um, why are you uh, kicking against the darkness? I said, well, because I don't want to be in the darkness. I don't want to be in the light. I want out of this, man. Make it stop. And, uh, you know, this is the devil and this and that. And, um, um, and, and the Lord just ministered to me something that. He said, when you stop complaining, when you stop complaining about the place I have you in, 
hmm, the place he has me in. When you stop complaining about the place I have you in, I can start leading you out. When you stop complaining about the place I have you in, then I can lead you out. You see, there's, there's things that God has got to work out that, that if your life is going to achieve your destiny in the Lord, you, you, you've got to be willing to go through some stuff. You've got to be willing to go through some stuff. So, so out of this, I said, Lord, give me some ta- takeaways from this. What, 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 you know, let's just unpack these uh, verses here and let me, let me think about what is it that you want me to get from this. And, I, and the first thing out of verse 8, I got this, that favor ain't fair. Favor ain't fair. Now, guys, I, I know that's, that's Gates County English, but it's true nonetheless that the favor of God ain't fair. It ain't based on your skin color. It ain't based on your education level. It ain't based on your, your, your sex, whether you're male or female. It's not based on your age. It's not based... Favor isn't fair. When, when you begin to walk in the favor of God, doors open that no man can open. Enemies are defeated that you could have never defeated. Situations arise and, and, and uh, blessings uh, overtake you that you couldn't have manufactured even if you were the millionaire. Favor isn't fair. When God begins to move something in your life, when God begins to, to operate in your life, it, the, people can't, they can't say, well, you know, she only got this because of... No. You can't make those kinds of assumptions. God begins to do something more powerful, more powerful than what our human minds can put together. And it's usually done for the life who is uh, surrendered and walking in, in uh, God's call and purpose. I, I, I began to think the other day um, about, uh, I, I hear a lot of preaching, and I used to preach a lot on the fire of God. We need to fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit, oh, the fire. But then the Lord just, just arrested me, and he said, everywhere I talk about fire, Eric, I'm talking about purity. The Bible, fire purifies. Now, most Pentecostal preachers like myself, we want the fire to mean like signs and wonders and all this, you know, anointing and power. No, no, no. Nowhere do you find that. Fire cleanses and purifies. Fire always speaks of an adversity that creates a character. The fire of God, and I want the fire of God. I just don't like it sometimes. The fire of God purifies, it molds, it melds, it, it superheats and pushes out the garbage. The fire of God then allows the favor of God. Come on, somebody. Favor ain't fair. I love verse 8 here. He says, how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? That's favor. That this prophet is saying to him, listen, it ain't about whether these folks were slaves or not. It ain't about whether they wandered in the desert like a bunch of uh, vagabonds and a bunch of bums. It's about the fact that God hasn't cursed them. I can't curse them. If God hasn't denounced them, how in the world can I denounce them? If they have the favor of God, if the favor of God is moving with them, if the cloud and the fire, what can I do? The favor of God ain't fair. When you're walking in the favor of God, there's, there's, I, I love uh, Romans 8 uh, uh, really puts a cap on this. Romans 8, 28 uh, through 31 talks about how all things work to the good. All things. Somebody say all things. You, 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 got, you got to get a new look at adversity if you're going to get a new uh, 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 look at your destiny. Come on, somebody. Huh? All things work to the good for those who are called according to His purposes, for those who love Him. Uh, and then he goes on to say this, that if God is for you, then who can be against you? Huh? Lord, how come the last time I got into a situation, I didn't think like that? How come the last time I got in a situation, I thought, I'm going to tell you what, I, 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 instead of just thinking, hold on. If God's for me, what are they going to do to me? All of a sudden, that adversity that you may be experiencing with another human being, then you could say, this ain't flesh and blood. 
I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. You can begin to see things in a different way. And when you begin to see things in a different way, you begin to respond in a different way, and it changes your destiny. Somebody give the Lord a hand. Clap praise for that. Amen. I, I, I thought back to um, um, the opportunities that presented themselves along the way of uh, launching the upper room assembly and um, doors of supposedly opportunity had opened along the way uh, and there was much adversity um, uh, in, in launching this and then all of a sudden these offers would come to leave here and go pastor a church at the beach or go be on staff at this ministry or that and, and, um, and I thought wow there's all this adversity here in Gatesville are these, these opportunities are but I had conditioned my response. I had, had, I had set in place that until Jesus told me to leave Gatesville. Come on, somebody. I, you're not going to get your destiny until you, until you change your thinking about adversity. You see, there was no amount of adversity in launching this ministry. There was no amount of adversity in pastoring this church. There was no amount of adversity in the finances or in life or in ministry or in family. There was no amount of adversity that could change my view of the destiny. That because you sent me here, Jesus, I'm not going anywhere until you tell me to leave here. When, when you change the way you view the adversity, then you can walk out your destiny. So we see here that, that this prophet was trying to explain to this king that, listen, if God's not cursed them, how can I curse them? If God's blessed them, what am I going to do about it? How can I denounce someone? And, and, and we see that the Word of God is clear on this. That if He who gave His Son for us, if He would sacrifice His very Son for us, how will He not Give us all things in life. You see, the promise stands from that Proverbs 3 passage we read at the beginning. He's saying, I am with you and I will be beside you. Amen? Don't worry about what others say about you. Don't worry what others are doing about you. I mean, think about this. This king and his prophet are on a mountaintop and they're getting ready to curse and God just... Nothing. Nothing. Why are you worried about what people say about you? Change your thinking about adversity. Let's get on board with your destiny and begin to walk with Jesus for what He's called you to do. You see, nothing could change the destiny of Israel. They were destined to take the land. And even if God had let a whole generation die and a new generation come in, they will take the land. Thank you, Lord. Glory. Amen. So favor isn't fair. But out of this, I thought verse 9 really just spoke something deep to me. And it's about this fire issue. And it's this. You need to live holy. You need to live holy. Look at this in verse 9 here. It says, From the rocky peaks I see them. From the heights I view them. Now look at this. I see a people who live apart. Come on, somebody. I see a people who live apart, he says, and what? And do not consider themselves one of the nations. Wow. You know, we just had a, we're having a shocking experience in, in the United States right now with the, um, with the evangelical community, with believers who believe, evangelicals, we're, we're those ones that believe you must be born again. Come on, somebody. That, if you want, what's an evangelical Christian? They're the ones that say you've got to get saved. All right? There's some Christians that just say that they're not really sure how that thing works and so they don't talk about it. But we're the ones who say, you must be born again. You've got to get saved. You've got to give your life to Jesus. Amen? That, that's what an evangelical is, is that we want to evangelize. Amen? But, but something's happening in the evangelical community. Over the last uh, uh, five or six years, seven years, um, they have been checking out of the political arena in the United States. In, in, uh, um, in um, 2012, they, the, the numbers were astonishing. 36 million evangelicals failed to vote. That was 26 million more, 28 million more 
then in 2008 just said, we're not voting. I don't, we don't like either candidate. We don't like what either one stands for. And we're not going to play this political game. We're just going to sit it out. Now, there's a lot of politicians who are mad at that because, you know, they pander for votes and they want these people to vote. And the Christians were saying, nope, ain't doing it. I knew, I had many pastors. I said, hey, how are you going to handle this election thing uh, 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 with your church? And he said, I ain't, because I ain't going to vote, and I'm not going to... I thought, really, you're not going to vote? And he said, nope, not going to vote. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I can't, I can't vote for a communist, and I can't vote for a Mormon. And he said, I'm, not, I'm just not going to do it. I thought, wow. And I began to think about that. I was angry at him, actually. A couple of pastor friends of mine. I was angry. I said, no, this is America. You're supposed to vote. You better... Now, I'm not advocating you don't vote or do vote. This is America. You have a right to vote. Get out and do it. What I'm saying is, is that we saw a trend that's shocking a lot of people, and it's pulling the rug out from a whole party right now who has counted on this Christian vote for the last 40 years. Christians are drawing out from the political system, but if that was all that was happening, I would say, yeah, big deal. But Christians are withdrawing from the educational system also. Homeschooling is sweeping the nation. Homeschooling is sweeping the nation. Homeschool conferences everywhere. I think um, the, the numbers in North Carolina, North Carolina is one of the fastest growing states. They don't even have any laws for homeschooling yet because it's happening so fast. The legislature never thought that they needed laws for homeschooling. But Christians everywhere are saying, I'm not sending my kids into that mess. I'm not sending them into a war zone that hands out condoms and, and talks about craziness. I'm going to raise my kids at home and teach them about Jesus and they can learn one, two, three, A, B, C from me. Listen, guys, there's something happening here. There's a, there's a drawing out of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is separating. And in verse 9 here, we see it says, From the rocky peaks I see them. From the heights I view them. I see a people who live apart and do not consider themselves one of the nations. We are called, the very word church, ecclesia, is the Greek word ecclesia. What does it mean? It means separated people. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is what? It's a bunch of people who have been separated from the world by the blood of the Lamb. Because of the forgiveness of our sins, because of the Holy Spirit that's within us, because of the holy lives we lead, we've been separated from the world. And so Balaam and Balak, they're looking down from that mountain, and what do they see? They don't just see an army coming. They don't just see a people who are blessed and got the favor of God that ain't fair. They see a holy people. Come on, somebody. They see people who live separate. They see people who are not engaging in the sin around them and playing games with it and scared to talk about it. And they're saying, no, nah, I ain't got no part of this. They see a separate people. You see, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Glory to God. So we have to live holy. And I, and I thought about what, what I said, Lord... What did you say about this? And I thought, wow, what a great verse. Matthew 5, 8. If you remember, in Matthew 5, 8, Jesus, uh, this paraphrase here, says that the pure at heart will see God. Huh? I don't know about you, but I want to see Him. I want to be with Him. I want to experience Him. I need Him. I need Him. Listen, I had 31 years of being a sinner. I had 31 years of being a heathen, and I taught myself very well something about myself, that I couldn't do it. I couldn't do life. I need Him. And He said, the pure at heart will see God. And I want to see Him, guys. How about you? He said, He looked down from the mountain. Hallelujah. <laughs> looked down from the mountain. And he saw a people who were separate. A people who said, I, we're, we're not even going to consider ourselves one of the nations. But you know, that angers people. Man, Christians anger people like nobody's business. And we, we're feeding more people than anybody feeds. We clothe more uh, uh, homeless than anybody. We, we give more money to charities than anybody. 
We accept anybody and love them and pray with them and on and on and on. We do 12-step programs. Oh, just the church is out there loving and blessing. But man, we tick a lot of people off. Because with all that love, we say, you know what? But I can't get in your sin with you. I'm going to be separate. Glory to God. So we've got to live holy. We're going to walk in this thing. Favor ain't fair, but, but guys, you've got to live holy. And, and the last thing, and I thought this is, uh, this is so awesome here. In verse 10, that eternity is ours, guys. Eternity is ours. And other people see that if you're living it. If, if, if you're walking in the favor of God, if you're living holy, listen, other people know it. And they know that eternity belongs to us with Jesus. Look at verse 10 here. He says, Who can count the dust of Jacob or number even a fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the who? The righteous. Now this is the prophet. He doesn't been brought up there, give all this gold and told to curse these people and he's wrapping this thing up with going, I want to be one of them. Come on. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number even the fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and may my final end be like theirs. Woo! Come on, somebody. This guy is a prophet. He's, he's got this powerful position. The king, Balak, has come and said, I'm going to give you all the gold you want. Get up on that mountain and curse these people. He says, I can't do it. God's with them. What am I going to do? He says, by the way, look at this. They, they, they live holy. They're separate. And then he wraps this thing up and goes, you know what? When I die... I hope to be like, I want to be with them. Wow, guys. You see, if we stop complaining about our problems, and we start talking about our God, if we start looking at adversity differently, and walking in our destiny, come on, somebody. Mmm. Huh? If we start walking in that favor, because you've already got it. What did he say? If, if God's for you, who can be? Oh! Why ain't we acting like that? We, 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 we're mad in the checkout line when they forget to give us our $5 back. Like God ain't still with me. If we start acting like people who walk in the favor of God, if we let the fire of God purify us and live holy, and if we live like people who are going to be in eternity with Christ, people of peace, other people are going to be looking at us and going, I want to be with them. I want to go where they're going. Glory. It will bring glory to God. I thought about the uh, Revelation 21.4, guys. And you all are familiar with this, but I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to let you have it anyway. It said, He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things will have passed away. Amen. Guys, everybody suffers on this earth. But the adversity we go through has an upside. And we're going to talk about that for the next couple of weeks. We're going, to, we're going to nail some of it down. But we had to set the tone here to know that our adversity has an upside. Do you, do you think the Israelites really wanted a, a king and a kingdom that was going to come against them and try to destroy them? No, they didn't want that adversity. But it had an upside. Hmm? It was letting the people of all of Canaan land know that these people were with God, but more importantly, God was with them. I am looking forward to, and I've got to tell you, if you've ever been in a tough place in your life, and since I've just preached this, I know you have. If you've ever been in a tough place in your life, it causes you sometimes to ride down the road and say, Lord, just take me home. Just take me home. You see, adversity will make you long for eternity. And it also causes you to purify yourself. I want to be with the Lord. I want to be a place where there's no more tears or pain. But you know what? Why not right now? Why don't I change the way I look at the hard times? Why don't I change the way I talk about the tough times? Why don't I walk in the favor of God? Why don't I live pure and holy while I'm at it? And why don't I carry myself like someone 
who has eternity with Jesus to look forward to ahead. In the end, I'm going to give you what God gave me. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Everybody watching, be blessed. Walk in God's favor. Be quick to repent of your sin. Live holy, guys. And forgive others. And then keep your eyes on Jesus till the end. Because he's coming back. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise in here today.